see Indiva joining. You see Indiva joining. Ah. Uh. I should, I think, yeah, I will. He can unmute himself. Okay. Hi, Shekhar. Looking forward. Yes. It's good to see you after a long time. Long time, yes. So much has happened in between. That's right. <laughs> All well with you, I hope. Yeah, we are quite safe here so far. And the uh, academic full steam ahead. Yes, academic um, life is going on okay. Mm -hmm. And as you know, I'm just finishing end of this year, in end of December. Yeah. And yeah. So. Well, finishing, but not finishing academic work, I can see. No, hopefully not. <laughs> I suspect that will become even faster and faster. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Yeah, so um, so I got this notice from the Seagull uh, Foundation, which is right. very good that such an event is organized. If I had known that you would be here, I would have been more thoroughly prepared. You are always thoroughly prepared, Shekhar. Uh, the books are proof of that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Shall we begin? Yep. Yeah. Okay, Ishan. Yes. Okay, great. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Based on time zones, you are watching us, you are joining us live on YouTube and Zoom and the Facebook page of History for Peace. Uh, today's event is being organized uh, in collaboration with uh, Heritage for Peace, uh, History for Peace, I'm really sorry. So thank you so much, uh, Meena Malhotra ma'am, for organizing this. Then we have a very special guest with us, Professor Shekhar Bandhopadhyay, sir. He doesn't need an introduction, truly. Professor Bandhopadhyay is a specialist on the history of modern India, and he has written extensively on the meaning and complexities of India's experience of transition from colonial to the post-colonial period. What freedom actually meant to various individuals, communities, and political mm -hmm. parties, how they responded to it, how they extended its meaning, and how in their anxiety to confront the realities of free India, they began to invent new enemies of their newly acquired freedom. In today's session, Professor Bandhopadhyay will be taking pre-submitted questions from teachers across schools based on his recent lecture for Carvan titled Decolonization, Change and Continuity. So skipping the part of the introduction, I would uh, straight away go to Professor Bandhopadhyay. Uh, good, uh, good morning to you, sir. Good evening, I think. Good, and good welcome to the session. And good, good morning to all of you. <clears throat> it's such an honor to, ho to host you, sir. Thank so you. the first question to you, sir, is a three part question. It is, <clears throat> is, uh, you know, the decolonization, uh, the decolonization process is still complete, but do we Indians as people still demonstrate a colonial mentality in a concrete way? Or do you, how far do you think decolonization of the mind has been effective in, in the Indian context? And if my, if I may add to this, how is decolonization linked with the process of subject formation in the post-colonial landscape? Okay, thank you, Eshan. Thank you um, for inviting me and to respond to the questions that have been submitted to you on the basis of the, <clears throat> of the earlier presentation I made for your Karwan program. So I'm assuming that everyone has listened to that presentation. So I will not be repeating what I have said already, but I'll go straight to the questions and come up with my responses. Um, but, and then 
after the initial responses, I can possibly take up uh, follow-up questions on that. I think the first questions, um, or if I kind of uh, deconstruct it, there are a number of questions, about two or three questions um, taken into one. Are the big questions about the transition of 1947? And um, I will start by just observing what uh, the Cambridge historian Joya Chatterjee has recently written about how do we understand the importance or significance of 1947, the year? And she argues, she says, I mean, this is a very important um, quote from her writing that it should be better understood as a year of crisis rather than an end of an era or a defining moment of a revolution. And I had noted in my writings, as well as in my previous presentations, that I look at it as a, as a moment of transformation and where we find um, both transition, translation, transformation of various institutions and ideologies. Um, and there were a lot of continuities between the colonial and post-colonial period, but I would also argue there were also very significant or momentous changes as well. But once again, I'll reiterate my earlier position that this transition was a rather messy process. It was not a clear cut watershed that before August 1947, we had the colonial period and after 47, we have the post-colonial period when the colonial legacies were all gone. I mean, this was the expectation of many of the nationalists. Gandhi, for example, had written to, uh, written in the Hind Swaraj that after 1947, the Swaraj should mean Indian institutions replacing the old English institutions so that we don't end up with um, English rule without the English men. Or in other words, many nationalists like him were possibly expecting a complete epistemological break, but, but that never happened. The process of transition was messy and complicated and incomplete and possibly one could argue it's still going. So it's not that immediately after the event of 1947, we could see a post-colonial nation assuming its own subjecthood, it's becoming self-conscious of its own identity as well as um, its own history and was prepared to, to, in, to take the next step to create the trajectory or to, for, to outline the trajectory of, of its own future. Because this was a, very much a time for debate and discussion. So, I tried to mention that in this period, we see number of continuities, for example, in the institutions, in the rituals and uh, the, the legal frameworks and so on. But there were also significant changes. And so it's not that the colonial mentality was going, the colonial institutions were being continued, the co colonial administrative structures were being followed. The major change that one could argue as a kind of symbolic of the establishment of the sovereignty of the new nation state was the new constitution which came into existence in 1950. There could be argument that the constitution itself represented a lot of continuity. A large section of the Government of India Act of 1935 was actually moved into the constitution. But there were also very significant changes. I will not go into the document itself, but I would argue in terms of the everyday existence of the constitution in the people's life, or the change really happened in the people's everyday experience of the state and how they responded. I mean, in recent times, there have been a number of studies which shows that people became more conscious of their citizens' rights. People began to ask questions. 
people began to emphasize um, the, the issue of accountability of the public servants as well as their politicians. So, and in other words, the change from colonial to the post-colonial is the consciousness of an individual citizen's right, that it is their country, the, the people who are governing them are their representatives, and so it's not the Mabab government anymore. So they can ask questions, they can demand accountability. And almost immediately, I mean, there is a recent book on UP by Harold Gould and uh, Sarah Ansari, which shows that almost from the very beginning, people began to ask questions about the rationing system, the control, they, they demanded the control because they thought this control of the rations was a colonial legacy. They wanted to change it. And their attitude to, to the bureaucracy, the local level, the ground level bureaucracy also changed. And um, they began to ask questions. They began to um, demand explanation for practices which they considered to be corrupt practices. So in other words, there was much more conscious attempt in the everyday experience of the citizens to take control of the, the practice of government. So this was happening at the very ground level. And another work I can refer to, I had referred to earlier as well, the Rohit Day's work on the everyday constitution, which shows how the constitution was being interpreted, reinterpreted in the courts of law. And the citizens began to realize that under the new constitution, they have the right. They, if they did not like anything that the government was doing, they could take it to the court. And at the court, they could ask very legitimate questions and the government was bound to answer them. So this was a major change in the mentality of the local of the people at the very local grassroots level, where they began to assert their agency and they began to claim their kind of sovereignty. But there were also problems with that. And the problems and what in my other writings and books in which I have argued that while this expectation was coming, at the same time, those who were ruling, they kind of wanted to continue the old practices of governance. And where the old kind of autocratic means of controlling the, the people, um, they con that those things continued even after independence. I mean, we cannot forget that the First Amendment um, to the constitution was brought by Nehru's government in nine, within a year, which was to curb the freedom of the press. Although it was meant to be a temp temporary mm, measure, but this was the beginning. And almost within months in various states, particularly in Madras and, and West Bengal, they brought in the security acts, the security acts to which would deal with unrest and which gave the government the power to arrest people without charge or without any trial for about for six months. And these acts were being justified by the same Congress party run government, which had once um, agitated against the Rowlett bill. And so th the old forms of um, governance continued in various places, in various pockets. But what I would also argue that while this was being followed, there was also resistance from the people. It was not that it was accepted by the new citizens and as a kind of legitimate forms of governance. And also, as I mentioned at the very beginning, the citizens were very much conscious of their rights to ask for explanations for what they considered to be the corrupt practices. One major change in this political field and the mentality of the people, I would also argue the introduction of the adult franchise. And um, this was a major change from the colonial period. Uh, even the constituent assembly, when it was elected, the members were elected on the basis of 
the government of India Act of 1935, which, which had enfranchised only about 10% of the adult population. But now all the adult pe citizens were prepared to vote and they did vote. I mean, if you look at the history of the first election in 1952, I mean, I found it amazing when I looked, when I was researching on this first election, looking at the newspapers and the reports, it was a very complicated process. I mean, it was a two-tier election system and the, elect the, the very process of casting vote was problematic. But in spite of that, um, people voted. And what I found in the case of West Bengal, and now <clears throat> Gulden Ansari has come up with uh, the situation in UP, is that all those politicians who were known as corrupt politicians, they were defeated in the election. So in other words, people knew that they had the voting right where they could assert their own citizens' right and could get the politicians who they thought were corrupt but not properly accountable to, to get rid of them. So this was, I think, there were certain areas of change that was taking place. But as I said, that this change was taking place slowly, gradually, it was not a momentous, dramatic change. And so, and as for other, if I could, just elaborate on a few other subject formation that, that was uh, pointed out. Now, subject formation, obviously, as, um, uh, as it is theorized, it's a time-consuming process. It's a gradual process. It in involves empowerment. And there are many areas where such uh, empowerment on uh, an organization and uh, the subject formation was taking place. I mean, one was I could explain that, develop that further later. Dalit politics, I mean, which came up during this period. I mean, Ambedkar's major contribution was to politicize untouchability. And by the 1950s, Republican Party was formed. And this Republican Party eventually went to the Black Panther and other movements kind of started. Although one could argue that this was not a very widespread movement yet, but as I said, this was the beginning of a new kind of politics, new kind of empowerment, which was coming up. And so was um, the women's movement. I mean, All India uh, Women's Conference was kind of getting organized around this time, raising voices about women's rights, about women's employment, about women's security against sexual violence and, and so on. So all these questions these various segments of the population were, were raised, which is, I would argue, is a major kind of sign of change in people's attitudes about exerting their rights, which was visible during this period of transition, which I identify as the 1950s. And from 1960s, other, other development starts, I, I would not like to go into that. So yeah, that's that's briefly my response to this question. Yeah, so um, uh, talking about continuity and change, there's there was also a change when you know people came together to form a nation, to form the idea of freedom in, in newly independent India. So the next question deals with that. Uh, you argue that several different collectives such as uh, caste, gender, religion came together in articulating the idea of freedom for the collective of the nation, where the collective of the nation assumed most significance, leading to some of these other collectives becoming subservient to it. In that then, was there an emulation of the script of the colonizer in privileging certain collectives and pushing out the others? Right, it's a very interesting question. My argument is that it was not emulation of the colonial discourse, but what was happening rather was a reversal of the colonial discourse. Now, about the colonial discourse, which was being kind of initiated from the top level, from the government level, 
coming from the colonial ethnology, colonial sociological understanding of Indian society, identification of various categories and so on, was what anthropologist Bernard Cohn has defined as the discourse of differentiation. So the colonial ethnology, ethnology kind of identified the various fissures. And right from the beginning, from if we start from James Mill's history of India through various other observations, there was a persistent argument that Indian population of the subcontinent was so divided, so differentiated along so many different lines that it is very unlikely that the Indians could form a nation. So this is what um, it's often kind of identified as the discourse of differentiation. There were various kind of lines of differentiation, caste, class, religion, region, language, and so on. Now, the one thing I would like to emphasize that these divisions were not as such created by the British. I mean, these divisions, these differentiations were there. But colonial ethnology, colonial knowledge defined it in a particular way so that they could be used for administrative purposes or for purposes of governance. So when the colonial rule was trying to normalize such a discourse of differentiation, the challenge that, that was my argument, if you have seen my book on nationalism, the, that's what I argued, that the challenge for the nationalists was to come up with a counter discourse and this would be the discourse of integration. And this is what started from Surendranath Banerjee's book, India and uh, a Nation in Making and so on. So they began to argue the other side of it, that those differences were there, they are not important, but we are nevertheless a nation. And this nation was defined in various ways, it was defined as a kind of civilizational nation. It was defined as a kind of naturally given territorial nation and so on. So in other words, I would argue the nationalist discourse was a counter narrative, a counter discourse to the colonial discourse of differentiation. So it's not emulation as such. And when the independence came in 1947. My reading of Indian history is that at that moment of time, uh, there was yet no consensus on about the, the nature of the nation, its future trajectory, its ide ideological orientation and so on. So there was still discussion, there was still debate going on. There were people who, who were not quite happy with what was happening at the governmental level. They were contesting it at various levels. So in other words, when the independence came, there was also, I mean, there was still a lot of debate discussion going on about the nature of the Indian nation and about the possible future trajectory of the nation. And therefore, the state as it came into existence, kind of took it upon itself, the nation building process, as we say. I mean, so what started from 1947 was also a kind of nation building process from the top, from above. And that's why there was a very conscious attempt to normalize a narrative that India was a natural nation, it was united, so, and in spite of the diversities that we had, and that's why the government started to kind of initiate the discourse and try to normalize it, the whole discourse of unity and diversity, where the unity was more emphasized, more privileged than the diversity itself. But I won't say that um, not all the other collectives could be suppressed or um, and those voices came up and as I already mentioned um, the Dalit voice came out um, Ambedkar was a major proponent of that voice within the constituent assembly and later on within 
the government itself, within the parliament and the government itself. I would also say the women's voice were coming up during this um, period. I mean, uh, immediately after independence, I think it was 1948, there was um, the, the government of India inherited the, the civil service and it wanted to expand the civil service through direct recruitment. And there was a notification for uh, inviting applications for IAS and IPS. And it was specifically written that it was only meant for men. And the All India Women's Conference immediately protested that why should it be only for men? I and mean, why should some employments uh, would be gender specific? So in other words, the, the other voices were coming up as well. And so in other words, uh, as I mentioned that um, the counter narrative of unity was now being projected through the government. But one could also argue that while emphasizing more and more on the unity aspect, this official narrative kind of ignored the fragments to some extent. So their grievances, I mean, they could feel were not being properly addressed at all levels. And there was also resistance to some of those um, voices and which came up in a very ugly way when I, I was referring to the women's question, it came up in a very ugly way, this resistance from the conservative section within the Congress when the Hindu court bill um, came up for discussion. And there was so much resistance to that Hindu court bill, which was mainly addressing the, the entitlements of Indian women um, that Gandhi, uh, sorry, Nehru practically had to give in and, and diluted and divide the, the, divided the act into two competing acts, which kind of very much um, were very much watered down. So in other words, there were ambiguities as well. And these ambiguities showed that the dominant kind of discourse um, was, tall, was still not um, comfortable about accommodating the other voices coming from the other collectives. So, and this ambivalence possibly is still unresolved. I mean, this is it's going on in various ways. Yeah. Okay, so I'll stop there. Yeah, so the next question is actually very interesting because it's about, uh, you see, the importance of culture of imperialism. So borrowing from Seth's concept that the power to narrate or block a narrative is of foremost importance with the culture of imperialism. How would you think this power of narrativization and blocking of narratives trickled into sustain, uh, sustain, sustaining the continuities that you show were prevalent in the political landscape of the post-colonial period? It's a very good question. I mean, I think all states tried to construct its own narrative of the nation according to its own ideological preference. And there is no exception. And I'll start from one observation that the first meeting of the Indian Historical Records Commission, uh, which was formed and which was presided over by the Ministry of, Minister of Education, which was Maulana Azad. So Maulana Azad, um, in the first meeting of the Indian Historical Records Commission said that until now, history of India was being written by the British. And so it was either imperial history or the nationalists were writing from a patriotic point of view. So now the time has come, we have to write the real history of India. Now the question was, what is the real history of India? I mean, who decides what is the real history? Is, is it the state or the historian themselves? Or it gradually emerges through serendipitous research done by the scholars from various fields? And that is the question. So in other words, this attempt to influence the narrative of the nation was there from the very beginning of the republic. Even I would argue, I mean, um, 
the formation of the Indian Council of Historical Research. I mean, it was to kind of sponsor research, historical writing and, and uh, mainly to identify and reconstruct the history of the nation. So in other words, this ideological, or I would say the attempts to control the narrative of history from specific ideological position is nothing new that is happening. And, and this, happened, this has happened in many other places as well. But at the same time, there were also independent research. The independent research of history, which was going on from the 1960s onwards, and um, which was, and there, there was no attempt to control that independent stream as well. So even if, and that's that's, by it's a it's a complicated position, that on the one hand the government in power wanted the history of the nation to be written from a nationalist perspective. But on the other hand, there were historians who were writing histories from various ideological positions and various methodological kind of orientations. And all these things were going on simultaneously. And so it's one another interesting coincidence I can point out. I mean, um, the centenary of um, the 1857, I mean, the government commissioned a history of 1857, uh, which was, I think, written by Surendranath Sen. And the independent historian Ramesh Majumdar wrote another volume on the 1857. Interestingly, both came to similar kind of, kind of conclusions. So in other words, what I tried to mention, uh, emphasize that while the government wanted to control the narrative, but this control was within certain limits, they would not infringe the scholars independence with their methodologies and their findings. But of course, um, there has been from the very beginning to have a more nationalist narrative, but this was not to dislodge other competing narratives that were there. Yeah. OK? Yeah. So you mentioned how the citizens of the country celebrated their independence through instances of them going into the government houses, thereby reclaiming those spaces. So there is much conversation about decolonizing spaces at this point of time. So would you say that reclaiming space is equivalent to decolonizing it? Or is there more to that process of, of you know, uh, reclaiming a space? Yes, what, what I observed in my book about this very interesting incident, which I found happening in West Bengal, the capital city of Calcutta, where several thousands of people on the very first day, 15th August, when the flag hoisting ceremony was taking place on the lawns of the government house, they just, several thousand people, they just broke open the iron gate. And then for a couple of hours, thousands of people were freely roaming around uh, the governor, governor house. And the governor was escorted out of the building and straight to the airport where he, they, he the governor and his wife, boarded the aircraft and left. And that is how ended British rule in West Bengal. And if after that, this crowd went to the Legislative Assembly building, where once again, the new governor was addressing and the thousands of people rushed into the, uh, the Assembly Hall and started shouting slogans, Jai Hind, and so on. So I thought, these two places, the government house, the private residence of the governor of Bengal and the legislative assembly, these were the two most sacred places of the British Raj. And when these people got into that, 
they were seemingly symbolically reclaiming the space which they thought belonged to them, but which they thought had been kind of uh, usurped by the foreign rulers, and they are now reclaiming it. And also interestingly, when this crowd left the government house, they took away with them various memorabilia, like pieces of curtain, pieces of furniture, and so on and so forth. Now, this was the event. The event had a symbolic significance, what I was reading as the symbolic um, reclaiming of the space. But space becomes associated with identity when we impose meanings on those spaces. So just when we acquire a land, piece of land, when we buy the piece of land, our emotional attachment to that land is not complete. It's just about to begin. And then there is a process involved. And this process could be as colonial as it was before. So once again, once the gates were broken, but that does not mean, or that did not mean that the gates would always remain open for them. So in terms of governance, as I said, that um, once again, the old forms of governance came in. And there were also restrictions and exclusivism which came in. And um, the forms of crowd control, I mean, these were more liberal, generous on the first day of independence, but they did not remain this, the same over the years. So in other words, yes, I agree that reclaiming the space did not necessarily mean decolonizing the space. Because for, a, for some time, those old colonial systems of governance went on. But there was still a difference. The difference being the people could see that it was not the European governor general or the European governor who resided in that house. And the difference was quite significantly felt after the first election of 1952 when many of the new elected representatives to the Legislative Assembly were their own people. Because as I was saying, the previous Legislative Assembly was still elected on the basis of um, very limited um, franchise rights. I mean, only about 10% of the adult population could vote. But now after 1952, there were many people who were going to the Assembly who were just for the first time in their life, going to the assembly, and they were coming from very ordinary families and houses. So people could see that now those who are going to the legislative assembly are our own people, and we have elected them and they are accountable to us. And so, in other words, although those spaces once again became exclusive spaces, but there was also a new meaning imputed on them, that these places become, became the spaces for the elected representatives of the people. And that, that's where the change, but that change took a few years to happen. And looking at the central place, I mean, when we see at the rice in our hills. I mean, people could see that the occupier and the, the person who lives in rice in our hill is no longer the, the viceroy, but the Indian elected representative of the state, the head of state who's elected by the elected members of the people, representatives of the people. And that's where the change comes, but the change takes time. So in other words, as going back to the point which I mentioned at the very beginning, that this was a long drawn process. It was not, hap it could not happen overnight. It was not a dramatic change, but it was the beginning of a process where the space was reclaimed and then meanings were imputed. Then it became symbols of identity. 
Okay. Great. Yeah. So uh, the next question is about somebody very special in today's India. He is the first Prime Minister of the Independent India, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, and his contribution to the process of decolonization is immense, irrefutable, and undeniable. Yet he did not address the cracks in this "quote unquote" secular card, given the fact that identity politics has had been a critical and contentious issue for most of the national movement. What are your comments on 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 this? That's a very important question in today's India. For many things that's going wrong, this this gentleman is being held responsible for that. My reading of the history of this period is that Nehru was still within his political party, within his circle, a very lonely figure. On the one hand, he had almost a religious faith in secularism. That very first, the very beginning, he identified that India had two enemies. The independent India had two enemies. One was poverty and the other was communalism. And he was trying to fight communalism, but commun my reading of this period is that by trying to fight communalism, there was possibly also a tendency to marginalize people who had kind of took a middle position about this. The communalism, as it's, it was kind of suggested through the constitution and implemented through government policies, was a very ambivalent kind of secularism. The constitution does not prescribe for a strict separation between the church and the state. It only says equidistance from all religions. And it is very difficult to maintain the, for the government equidistance from all the religions. And that was the dilemma of this period. The way secularism was defined by the constitution. So by the majority of the Congress were Hindus and they had their different kind of views of how the nation should evolve. It was not that nation should maintain equidistance from all the religions. There was a very widespread feeling in India that the partition was a kind of divide on the basis of religion. I have seen numerous letters which were intercepted by the intelligence, police intelligence department where ordinary citizens were writing to the government that the Muslims were suspects. So they should, they have got their own country, so they should go back. And those who stayed there in India, they should prove their loyalty to the new nation state. And within the Nehruvian government, within his caucus, there were very important leaders who still had shared this view. So in a way, Nehru was fighting a very lonely battle against a very strong lobby within his political party and within the country in general who believed otherwise. I have seen letters, particularly this came to a head when communal riots took place once again in 1950 in Bengal. It was a real nasty riot. Bengal somehow kind of escaped the worst violence of partition during 1947-48. Punjab experienced the worst kind of violence. But the same kind of violence which Punjab witnessed in 47-48 were repeated in Bengal in 1950. And then it was repeated in East Pakistan. And then it created a flow of refugees. It led to flow of refugees coming from East East Pakistan to West Bengal and Assam. Uh, 
And this had repercussions also in the West, where the recent book by Gould and Ansari shows that from Sindh, people began to migrate to UP and so on. When this was happening, Nehru was desperate to come out of it, to, to do something about it. I mean, if you read Nehru's letters to the chief ministers, he was writing again and again to all these chief ministers that, that they should do something because those Muslims who have opted to stay in India are also equal citizens of India and they should be treated like this. At one point of time, it's, a, it's in the parliamentary um, parliament um, proceedings, Nehru even threatened to resign if the communal riots did not stop. At that point of time, Nehru signed the Delhi Pact with his Pakistani counterpart and the communal riots stopped. And that riot, I mean, that Delhi Pact was signed under a serious conditions. And recently, the, we have the book, a new book by Pallavi Raghavan. And Pallavi suggests that the situation was such that there was a very strong lobby within the Congress, within the government and within the, within the country, which were actually taking India into the war, into the path of a war with Pakistan. So this Delhi Pact was actually averted, that outbreak of war between the two very, very infant states. So in other words, it is easy to blame Nehru, but Nehru was, I believe, the, the documents I have seen, Nehru was fighting a very lonely battle around this time. His problems came from the ambiguity of the constitution in defining mm. sec, uh, the, what should be the secular path for India, which kind of said that the state should be equidistant from all the religions, but that was practically very difficult because within his party, within his um, close circles, within his government, there were powerful people who thought otherwise. Yeah, yeah. So the next question takes us to a very global context of decolonization where we, uh, you know, we discuss the process of decolonization, not just in India, but also in African colonies like, uh, you know, Kenya and Ghana. So how, how does the process of decolonization in India compare with that in the Af African colonies of Kenya and, uh, you know, uh, Ghana different? And was the ideological orientation in these countries very different than India? First of all, I'll confess that I'm not a comparativist, but I also agree that decolonization needs to be understood in a global context. As so far as the decolonization process was involved, I think there were differences, <clears throat> but the differences were defined not by region, but by the nature of colonial rule, in the sense that different colonial regimes differed in their nature. British colonial administration differed from Dutch system of administration and that differed from the French colonial administration. So the most important comparativist I, I consider to be David Anthony Lowe. And Lowe argues that the British colonial administration was comparatively more liberal than the Dutch or French colonial administration. And in his formulation, the colonial administration worked on three principles. The first and foremost principle was force. All colonial regimes depended on force. The second was what he called legitimacy. And this legitimacy of colonial rule was gained in different degrees. Some, in some areas, colonial rule was thought to be more legitimate than in other areas. And then this the whole issue of legitimacy depended on what he calls the other principle, that is assuagement. That is from time to time, colonial rule gave concessions to the colonized 
to kind of enlist their support so that they supported colonial rule, legitimized colonial rule. This brings to the, the classic Gandhian position that British rule existed because Indians cooperated with them. So British rule could be ended if we withdrew the cooperation. So, and Lowe's argument, and I think there is a point in it, that these three principles worked differently in different regions. So because different situations, the, different, the contexts were so very different that sometimes the assuagement and legitimacy did not work. And particularly this was true in French and Dutch uh, rules where there was more dependence on just brute force and where concessions were offered it, they were offered in a very piecemeal way that did not satisfy the aspirations. The difference between Africa and India was that Africa was colonized after India. Africa was kind of um, coming into full colonial rule much uh, later, much after in uh, India. And what was even more important development of a Western educated elite was delayed in the African colonies. It was not until the First World War that we find Western educated elites taking the nationalist position in the African colonies. Whereas in India, we already have a matured nationalist movement uh, by that time. So that kind of defined uh, the periodization of the liberation movements. So in different countries got their freedom in different times. Now, he argues that in some cases it worked, like he says that in Uganda it worked, but in Kenya it did not work and led to violent movements like the Momo rebellion and so on. But in general, by the first world war, there was a greater consciousness in Africa, particularly among the, the, the Western educated elites in Africa about the, the modernity that colonial rule was bringing to them. And I can refer to another comparativist, Michael Adas, who argues that around this time, the Western educated elites in all parts of the, of the colonized world by the first time of the First World War, they were all involved in two projects. One was to contest Western modernity and the other was to construct their own national identity. And this all started by the First World War throughout this colonial world. But in India, this was already quite advanced because the whole process started in India much earlier. So in terms of ideological orientation, I think it was Africa and India more or less kind of represent the same kind of situation. Although uh, the timing was different for Africa, the, the, the season of liberation came in the 1960s, about a decade and a half after India's independence. But the real difference between India and other colonies was not in Af Africa. I'll extend that discussion and the question a little bit. The real difference we can find in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asian situation was little more different than the Indian situation in the sense that apart from Malaysia and Burma, which were under British rule, Indonesia, Indochina, that is Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, these areas were under Dutch and French control. And that after the Second World War, or by the time of the Second World War, Britain had more or less decided to get out of the colonies. But Dutch and French imperialism did not really think in terms of withdrawal. So after the Second World War, they once again wanted to reimpose their rule and that created a lot of conflict and bloodshed. But the two differing 
factors other than this reimposition of colonial rule after Second World War. The other two differing factors was one was the Japanese occupation. During the Second World War, all the, the whole region was occupied by the Japanese. The Japanese initially projected themselves as the liberator of Asians from European colonial rule. And many Asian leaders initially purchased that argument. But within a year, they realized that they, they felt the real nature of Japanese occupation. And then another kind of ideological movement starts, and that was the anti-fascist movements. That is a kind of different ideological orientation of the nationalist movements in this country. There was a very definite anti-fascist ideological strand. And the other major difference, I would say, was the importance and influence of communism. Both in Indochina and Indonesia, Malaysia, Burma, entire Southeast Asia, I would argue that communism was much more powerful than it was in India. In India, it was communist movement during this time was localized in South and East, in Andhra, in Madras, Madras presidency, and in the Bengal presidency, Bengal Assam areas. But rest of the country was not that affected by communism. Whereas by contrast, in the entire Southeast Asia, Indochina's nationalism was entirely motivated by communism. In Burma, communism was quite powerful. So was Malaysia. Malaysia, the British had to bring in brutal military force to crush the communist movement. So I'm saying that these are the two different elements which we find in the nationalist liberation movements in Southeast Asia. But I'm not very knowledgeable about Africa, but what I gained from these readings that African nationalism was more or less following the Indian lead, the same ideological orientation as such. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the cultural impact of imperialization is there, but capitalism has stopped the place and in the long run, it seems to be more fatal. Capitalism was just a part of the society first, but is it becoming a very big part or even the main society? You know, it is taking over the society today. So what are the ways to abolish capitalist imperialism? And can you throw some light on the issue of capitalist imperialism as such? Well, if I knew how to stop capitalist imperialism, I would have considered to be the greatest philosopher in the world, which I'm not. And frankly speaking, I don't know the answer to this question because from the very beginning of the Indian Republic, capitalism was there, despite the fact that constitution as well as government policies harped on socialism. But India's socialism was very ambiguous. And what went in the name of a mixed economy was some public sector, but at the same time, significant concessions and leverage to the private sector. Those who have written on the development plans of this early period, um, like Benjamin Zakaria, who, have, who has argued that if we look at the plans, early five-year plans and early development plans, we find very strong influence of the Bombay plan, which was designed by the Bombay-based capitalists just before, around the time of the Second World War, and just before the time of the Second World War. So in other words, capitalism had al always been there, and globally, capitalism has established its ascendancy since the demise of the Soviet Union. And the only other, I mean, in 
certain other countries possibly they have avoided it like cuba or venezuela but their development status i don't know how they are doing on the other hand the china model is more as experts say it's more a uh, kind of state capitalism rather than private sector capitalism but it has other aspects of it yeah. how to reverse the trend i i really i don't know and because capitalism as i see around me has been continuously reforming itself to establish its hegemony i mean we live in a world i mean where socialism has become an, a kind of pejorative word yeah. i mean in, i mean when you want to abuse someone you say he's a socialist and that is where we have come to that's that is where the ideological hegemony the our orientation of the mind has come to so um can we look for a revolution i don't know and uh, this is a question really i'm not very competent to answer but like you the the person who has questioned i'm frustrated as well yeah so uh, a small uh, announcement for the viewers uh, those of you who want to ask professor bandupadhyay any question can uh, you know write it on the zoom chat or youtube live chat and we'll take those questions in the q and a round Uh, so professor bandopadhyay my last question to you would be why did the bengalis in west bengal fail to develop theater free from the you know processionium shackles and why did colonization fail in kolkata theater and how do you see you know what are your views on the kolkata theater if, if, because you are from calcutta and you know <laughs> this whole organization is based in calcutta history for peace so i think this question is is a must to ask but this is really at the periphery of my knowledge i'm not really knowledgeable about theater i was interested in theater at one time but i i'm not really competent to answer this question i would only say i would only say that it is not that proscenium stage format has not been questioned i mean immediately what comes to my mind is badal sarkar's ongon moncho experiment in the 1970s which i knew very well i was personally associated with that but i then lost contact with that cultural world particularly after i left the country i now i just go there see one or two shows and that's all on a very general level what i'll say that theater is not theater is part of society and culture it is not not an isolated field where you can see changes happening at a different pace than in other areas of society and culture so in some areas of culture and society we have seen much rapid pace of change possibly theater is not possibly maybe the film format is becoming more popular where more experiments are coming up maybe in theater this investment of talent and money has not been that much as in other spheres i really don't know why this um arena stage is not being tried more and more but there was a time when different groups were experimenting with that i mean the period of my youth 1970s 1980s i knew there were many groups who were experimenting with it but possibly there was no taker i mean, i i don't really know what happened and i'm i'm not really com- competent to to shed any light on this so uh, i think there there's somebody who's saying that uh, she loved to hear your opinions on calcutta uh, 
stage in the 70s and 80s so maybe you can you know work you know write a book on it so i think we all would love to read it i i was very closely associated with the theater world in the 1970s but then i moved into more became engaged in academia and then i left that that part but when i was student in the early 1970s i was very interested in theater but well i now i just go there and see some shows but not really involved in the theater movement as such and my interests have shifted yeah so uh, i think we can start with the q and a session yeah uh, uh, megha ma'am if you allow i think some people can also raise their hand on zoom and then we can you know unmute them and they can ask them the question directly to sir if if time permits later on yeah let's go through the ones on the chat and then yeah. maybe move on to that yeah yeah so uh, there's a question from mr umar and his question is how would you look at partha partha chatterjee's political society in terms of fragmentation of the empire brexit and decolonial turn right um to put it very briefly that i'm not totally in disagreement with chatterjee's theory of political society but um and in a way in india and elsewhere also i mean politics has taken over um various forms of other modes of expressing citizens rights and so on but at one point i think chatterjee overstretches it where he ignores that i mean he on other occasions have, has said that um what he called the heterogeneous uh, time of modernity that various groups thought in different ways polit so but that does not come in this political society argument that different classes different groups in society had different ways of thinking politics so we cannot possibly universalize political society in such a way but even within the established political parties there are various fissures and and various uh tensions so we cannot really ignore those various ways where it it happens and although i mean in west bengal's um very specific case i can give you an example that once chatterjee's argument was that the political society was kind of gobbling the articulation of caste um factor but in recent years we have seen that that caste factor particularly on the part of the elite group is once again coming up and the the, the so called political society has not gone but different sections of the society are articulating their politics in different ways and there is a lot of a uh, kind of interaction going on within them um brexit i mean i i i don't really know much detail about going that whether really we should call brexit as the decolonial moment um we we need to see i mean brexit is process which is still unfolding um a political scientist can theorize on that but a historian would be more more cautious about um going into that without seeing all the aspects of it so i would rather leave it that so i would to summarize what i've said is i to a large extent i i agree with chatterjee's formulation of political society but i would also say there are limits of 
a political society which needs to be taken into consideration as well and which are coming up in recent years in various forms. I mean, West Bengal, which was once known that there was no caste politics, but now we find the caste politics is coming up. It's and it's not really cannot be resolved through the mainstream, the political mobilization that was going on. There has been a attempt to do that, to appropriate that. And Chatterjee thought that that would happen. But I don't think that has happened because it has bifurcated once again. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think we need to critically look at the situation much more. Yes, uh, you mentioned there was a rise of the Dalit movement. Uh, so Abhishek Roy's question is that soon after independence, there was a rise of the Dalit movement, which was le you know, led by Ambedkar. And soon afterwards, there was a rise of the conservatives, mostly through Raji Gopalachari, Swatantra, pa Swatantra Party politics. How did the Congress deal with these two dominant groups at that time? The Congress... I think did not do very well in dealing with either of these two groups. Um, <clears throat> Ambedkarite politics, Ambedkar had a very frustrating experience with the Congress. Congress had a wonderful opportunity to deal with his politics when Ambedkar agreed to join Nehru's government as the law minister and agreed to become the chair of the constitution drafting committee. And Ambedkar achieved a lot in the constitution. He did not get everything he wanted, but he achieved a lot. But he came to a frustrating point when he wanted to introduce the Hindu code bill. And when the Hindu code bill was introduced, the conservative elements within the Congress came out with, I mean, came out to stop him and to derail the whole legislative process um, almost in one voice. And Nehru was in a very frustrating situation. Nehru could not really control this section. And the Hindu court bill was kind of killed. And it was later on passed in a very watered down um, conditions. And it was divided into two parts, which really did not satisfy in the thing. So that really made Ambedkar realize that he could not get justice for the Dalit within the Hindu fold and within, and as long as the Congress was dominated by these conservative elements. And, and at that point, he resigned from the ministry and the Congress was having a total control over the political system at that time. And later on, he decided <clears throat> to to convert into Buddhism. But what he did was politicized untouchability. He kind of created a situation where Dalit movement as a separate political entity, as a po separate political mobilization could start. It was it soon start in the form of the Republican Party and it went on in various forms. So in other words, in 1947, Congress had a unique opportunity to deal with the Dalit question, to come to terms with Ambedkar, but they lost that opportunity. On the other side of it, dealing with the right, and this was another, in my reading, I have an article on that, the Hindu right in the post-independence period. Hindu right politics was going through a major ideological crisis following Gandhi's assassination. It was under attack from all parties. And it was at that time they were initiating 
an internal debate on their ideology, where there were many within the Hindu Mahasava who argued that there is there was a need in India for a right-wing democratic political party, which would not be associated with any majoritarian religious identity. And there was an internal debate within the Hindu Mahasava, but in that debate, once again, the conservatives won and that liberal section kind of lost that debate. And that liberal section was being led by um, Shama Prasad Mukherjee who came out, who was actually expelled from Hindu Mahasabha and who then started his own political party, Jansang. Now, Jansang in our political history is always associated with the RS, Hindu right-wing RSS. But when at the moment of creation, Jansang was not really a Hindu right-wing political party. It was conceptualized as a democratic political opposition, a right-wing democratic political opposition to the Congress. It believed in capitalism. It questioned socialism, communism, etc. It was not overtly communal, but thought that people had legitimate right to religion and, and being associated with religion. But at the same time, it followed a rather universalist agenda. That's the first agenda on the basis of which Jansang was formed. But from the very beginning, Nehru and the Congress identified Jansang as a communal party. And this constant pressure from Nehru and Congress kind of forced the Jansang to move closer to the Hindu right-wing groups, mainly RSS. In 1951, Mukherjee was invited by RSS to give a lecture. And if you read that lecture, he was reminding RSS that India is a pluralist country. And we should remember that when we define our politics. But that completely goes after a year or so when he was under constant pressure and being identified, stereotyped as a communal. So I would... And I, I have an article on this in, in a book which I edited called uh, Religion and Modernity in India. And, and I think that was a major political debate within the right wing. And there was a serious possibility that there could be a right wing political party which was non-religious, but that once again, that opportunity was lost. So, and the same thing went on as Swatantra Party came up once again with the right wing agenda. But once again, the right wing non religious political parties had, had been always under pressure. And this was also a Congress's issue. I mean, Congress also wanted a weak opposition. And this was very, I mean, this I have argued in my book on decolonization in South, South Asia, that this was very visible from the very first election campaign, that they wanted the power and they did not really like a powerful opposition. So in other words, the two groups you mentioned the right wing, the right, the right wing politics, as well as Ambedkar's Dalit movement, the Congress did not really do a very good job in dealing with that. It had the opportunity of dealing with it, but it did not utilize that that opportunity. Yeah, so okay. I think we 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 have almost reached the conclusion part of the session. We've already taken about one one hour fifteen minutes or so. So we have a very positive question, I think, to, to end it on a high note from Akhila Shishadri ji. And her question is, what is the idea of India you would wish for young people today? I would like to see India where I was born. And India 
which can boast of its pluralist tradition. An India which can boast to be a country of tolerance, where many cultures, many languages, languages, many religions can flourish side by side. That was India I was born in the 1950s. And that is the India which I would like to continue. Not that that does not mean that India must not modernize. Yes, India has to modernize. India has to accept modern technology. India has the best talent in the world in science and technology in social sciences. India must use those talents for its own use. India was always compassionate about the poor. India was always compassionate about the various groups. I would not say there was no room for reform. There were room for reform and I very strongly feel that the caste question was one of the major issues which was kind of the sore point of the Indian nationhood. So in other words, and we should kind of deal with it, we should think of empowerment of, um, of the Dalit and women and other, uh, the tribals, the Adibasis and so on, the weaker sections. That, is, that was the India which was what we in our childhood were, were aspiring for. And so that is the dream which I want to sell to our younger generations. An India which thrives on its modernity, which looks after its poor and the disprivileged and tolerates difference and pluralism. That's it. Yeah, that, that's a beautiful dream. And I think uh, uh, it was truly an honor, Professor Vandopadhyay, to be in a conversation with you and uh, truly a lifetime opportunity for me, for, for everybody who joined us live. And uh, maybe I, I, I should, uh, you know, hand over the stage to Megha Ma'am from History for Peace to take the proceedings forward. Thank you, Ishan. Thank you, Professor Bandhupadhyay. This has really been extremely valuable. And I think I'm speaking for all the participants uh, uh, who are here with us. And um, do, do we, uh, we, we have another five minutes? Shall I um, ask anybody wants to ask a question uh, or Professor, should we wind up now? Is there anyone else? Okay, I'm just going to read out what's in the chat some more. Uh, there was um, uh, there was one more question, Ishan. Um, what are your observations on the communism post-independence and present-day Indian politics? Where do you think India has been in these years? Um, would you like to take that, Professor? The one last one, and then we can... The... <laughs> it's a very large question. You will... Take a long time to properly right, then we can, we can, handle this question. We can let question. it be. Let it be. The, yeah, the communism um, came back after independence. On the the independence period, this transition period, particularly where the partition and the communal violence were taking place, and later on the transition to independence period, the Communist Party of India found it difficult to deal with that situation. And then it thought that to uh, deal with that situation, the, the, the available kind of um, model they had was the Telangana model and the Tevaga movement, which was going on. So in 1948, they revived those movement, which was kind of uh, violent insurgency, but that did not work. That did not work because there was not enough consciousness um, among the peasantry to identify with that kind of movement. It needed more mobilization. It needed more social consciousness before that kind of movement um, 
take place. So a momentous change took place after this. That Communist Party of India gave up its insurgency uh, mode and became an electoral political party. And this was a really historic shift in the history of the communism as such. And they, what was very remarkable in this first election in 1952, the Communist Party of India came out as the largest opposition party in the Indian parliament. And that trajectory went on. It became a kind of um, electoral party. It participated in election. But there was one problem in communist movement we had communist regimes in, in West Bengal, in Kerala, which is still going on. But even then, which I, I have a very interesting reading from one of the theorists of the communist movement, Zavid Alam. Zavid Alam has diagnosed this problem. The problem was that communist party wanted to get state power. And they thought that by getting state power, they solved the questions of class and, um, and inequality and so on. But they did not try to create a social consciousness to, among the people to, to, to support that kind of change. So what happens when they lost the election, there was a possibility of losing election. When they lose the election, their support base kind of disappears. And that is what we have seen in West Bengal, many of them have just gone away. And also getting power or being in power, they could bring in economic changes through legislation, but they have neglected the society. The so social changes they never kind of focused on. So that was a kind of weakness I see in the communist movement. And right now it's, it's in, I think it's in crisis. It has to reinvent itself and engage much more with the society and just class-based economic agenda will not do. So that's very briefly a brief comment. Thank you so much. I am quite sure that uh, our all our participants would want you to carry on, but we cannot uh, do that to you. So we shall end here uh, with much gratitude. And I see a lot of uh, Thank yous on the chat to uh, coming up. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I always um, find it very rewarding to speak to teachers. Um, and I feel that through you, I can reach the younger minds. And I really congratulate you, the great work you are doing and shaping the younger minds. And I'm now retiring from my teaching job and uh, hope I, I wish you all the best. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so very much. And we hope to uh, work, uh, you know, work with you further. I really hope we can.